College and the Popcorn Forum and Convocation Series. Uh, I hope that you're returning from other panels and other speeches that have been given this week. Uh, my name is Tim Rarick, and I'm the theater director at North Idaho College, and it's my honor today to be the moderator for this particular panel, which the focus is the family, specifically on the historical human quest for the development and the survival of the family. There is a uh, quote that I came across in the last week from a writer of regional um, birth and development, um, Marilyn Robinson, who wrote the book on housekeeping, uh, who wrote the book called Housekeeping. It was about housekeeping to a, to a degree. She said that the family will not be broken. Curse and expel them. Send their children wandering. Drown them in floods and fires. And old women will make songs out of all of these sorrows and sit in the porches and sing them on mild evenings. She speaks to the tenacity and the endurance of the notion of family, and in a way that is our theme here today. We have five panelists who are going to be speaking in the voices of distinguished people, living and dead, who offered distinctive voices distinctive notions of what the institution of family is. And I would like to introduce those panelists for you. Uh, first of all, David uh, Cohen. Uh, David, an NIC instructor in social sciences, who's going to be representing and speaking as the sociologist Karl Marx. Second, uh, Donna Rungi, an NIC counselor, who's going to be speaking in the voice of artist and lecturer and writer Florence Shin. Thirdly, uh, Dr. Victor Duarte, an IC instructor in social sciences, who's going to be providing the Latin perspective of the notion of family, speaking as himself. Carol Lindsay, an IC instructor in social sciences and child development, who is going to be presenting the voice of Marion Wright Edelman. I'll speak to you a little bit more uh, about more in the future. And finally, Dorinda Moore, an IC staff member, Secretary for Communication Arts, and also Secretary for the Popcorn Forum, who is going to be speaking to you as the archetypal figure, Rosie the Riveter. We are joined today on these five panel members by Dr. Diane Medved, whom many of you, I suspect, got an opportunity to hear this morning and she will have an opportunity to respond and comment on the presentation of the panelists immediately following. So I'd like to set up the structure for what we're going to do, and then we'll commence. We're going to have each of the panel members address you in their voice. Uh, they have uh, 10 minutes to do that, and then we turn out the lights on each one if they start getting longer than that. It's gonna be, gonna be 10 minutes of presentation on their part, then Dr. Medved will have uh, 10 minutes to respond to the panel. And then following that, we have a 20-minute block where we certainly welcome and want to have questions from you for the panelists to respond to. Uh, we do have to finish at 2.25, right, Tony? Because there's a uh, panel that's going to come in right behind us. So we'll lop off um, exactly at 85 minutes. Our first presenter, our first panel panelist this uh, day, um, is going to be the, bar, uh, the voice of Karl Marx, uh, 1818 to 1883, in terms of this journey through time. The economic, political, and social thinker whose ideas provided the inspiration for modern communism, Karl Marx. Well, first of all, I want to thank Tony Stewart for resurrecting my life today, uh, bringing me here. And second, I want to thank Ron Rankin and the uh, Kootenai County Commissioners for the English-only statute, so I don't have to spoke, uh, speak in uh, broken uh, German, and I can articulate the uh, English language to you uh, this afternoon. What I'm about to present to you is uh, taken from two of my uh, best-known works, um, 
the uh, Communist Manifesto and Das Kapital. My life's work taken as a whole is a sustained indictment of one alleged injustice, that the profit, the comfort, the luxury of one man is paid for by the loss, the misery, and the denial of another. Although in my time, this injustice was uh, far more obvious than in uh, most Western societies today, many of the same injustices continue to exist in modern societies that embrace an economic form of production called capitalism. When I uh, lived, the kind of capitalism that uh, existed was, cons was called or labeled uh, laissez-faire capitalism, uh, meaning unregulated capitalism. Uh, today's capitalism, you know, I uh, never anticipated that modern nation states would eventually regulate um, the capitalism that I criticized that existed in three European countries in the mid-1800s. That was Germany, France, and England. And I did notice, too, uh, since Tony brought me back in time, I've been able to catch up on some reading, you know. And I noticed in Tuesday's uh, uh, a newspaper called the uh, Idaho Spokesman Review, uh, a title that has Fortune 500 profits jump 23%. And I noticed that the author of this um, article, Terrence Samuel, says that while these uh, corporate profits have jumped 23%, the low light is that employee income gains were paltry compared with corporate profits. And um, ex excerpting from this article, it also states that the companies of a, uh, I've never heard of this group before, called the uh, Fortune 500, <laughs> have uh, restructured, re-engineered, refinanced, downsized, laid off, split up, and merged their way to prosperity. The magazine said in uh, an April 28th issue on, I've never heard of this either, newsstands uh, next week. Now, it seems to be a redundancy here. Restructured, downsized, laid off, to me, seems to suggest the whole thing. I mean, they were, what, like, fired? My basic premise is this. The economic base of a society determines its social structure as a whole, as well as the psychology of the uh, people within it. The economic base, or the technology of production, in other words, determines the nature and structure of all other institutions that make up a social system. Government, education, religion, law enforcement, the military, and most importantly, the family. Uh, I guess that's why I've been called by my critics and uh, those that have studied me over the years, I I've been labeled as an economic determinist because my thesis is that uh, it's the uh, economic sphere of a society that determines the nature and structure of uh, something I've called the superstructure, and that is every other aspect of our institutional life. It's not that uh, religion... Uh, uh, has an effect on the economy. It's not that uh, government has an effect on the economy. It's that the economy determines the nature and structure of every other aspect of our institutional life. On what is the family in a capitalist economic system based today? On capital and private gain. In its fully developed form, capital and private gain exists only for the capitalists, those that own the means of production. And has two important effects. One of these important effects is the destruction of the family life of proletarians or the workers in society. And the other, of course, is uh, public prostitution that workers are subjected to in their relationship to the owners of the means of production. I postulated over the years that basically when you look at any society, there are two uh, basic uh, groups of people, two classes of people. You have the capitalists that own the means of production, and they control uh, every economic resource, and they basically have all the power. And then you have the vast majority of people that uh, are called the proletarians or the workers. They work for those who own the means of production, and basically they have nothing. Capitalist phrase-making about the family, about intimate relationships between parents and children, becomes more and more sickening and hypocritical 
in proportion as the development of the world uh, of work severs all the family ties of the proletarians. The proletarian family, the working family, is transformed into a mere appendage of commerce and instruments of labor, a mere commodity in the capitalist scheme of things. What happens to workers today? They spend the best energy for X amount of hours producing something. They need their work in order to make a living, but their role is essentially a passive one. They fulfill a small isolated function in a complicated and highly organized process of production and are never confronted with their product as a whole, at least not as a producer, but only as a consumer provided they have the money to buy the, the product that they've produced in a store. Um, I've called this uh, theory that I have about um, being able to uh, buy the product that's produced in the store as something called the surplus value of labor. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Uh, my theory is this, that all of you in this room today work only because your labor produces a profit for someone else, for your employer. If your labor does not produce a profit, you don't work. I guess that's what was meant in this article by what? Downsizing or reduction in force or being laid off or being fired from uh, one's job. My um, idea was to, that, or I felt that the worker should receive the uh, surplus value of their labor. When you work, you work for a wage. I don't believe anybody should work for a wage. I don't think that we, I think we should get rid of wage labor. But whatever you're paid, you're never paid what you're truly worth because your employer needs to make some money off of your labor. And then the product that you produce is sold um, at, a, uh, at a higher cost than to produce. So that you kind of get, uh, excuse me, uh, exploited twice here. <laughs> I, I apologize for that. You get exploited twice. Not only are you not paid what you're truly worth. Someone else gets that. But then the product that you produce, you have to pay, uh, buy at an inflated price. And, and because of the wages that you receive, you may not be able to afford that which you've produced. Work in a capitalist economic system is a means of getting money. It is not a meaningful human activity. The worker is part of the equipment hired by the capitalist and their role and function are determined by the quality of being a piece of equipment. I've called this basically my theory of alienated labor, that most workers in a capitalist society are basically estranged from the product that they produce because you only relate to a segment of it. You never are part of uh, the, the producing of the totality of that product. And, so you're, and because you get wage labor, you're also alienated from that, uh, that product. The world of work is not friendly to the working family today. Politicians on the right and left may mourn the decline of family values in society, especially during an election year as a way to generate votes, I've found. But they will never alter the way business does business in order to preserve the integrity of the family. Profits inevitably become more important than family values. Family ba values have been sacrificed for profits and the making of capital. And I see around me still uh, poverty, homelessness, um, a, a workforce uh, of unemployed people. Uh, I also see uh, uh, an, uh, something that I uh, had a, hard, a difficult time grasping called the latchkey syndrome. Uh, children coming home to an empty house because their parents or one parent um, is working, working to sustain the family. What might be then the solution to this pervasive inequity that exists in society? Well, I uh, suggest a proletarian revolution, a working revolution, a workers' revolution. The seizure of the means of production away from the capitalists. This puts an end to commodity production and at the same time the exploitation of the proletarian family. The struggle to maintain a subsistence level of living 
comes to an end. Capitalism would be replaced uh, by a transitional socialist economy, and socialism eventually gives way to true communism, where the distinctions between uh, owner and worker no longer exist, because after the proletarian revolution, everybody would be both owner and worker. In conclusion, I'd like to make this last observation. Today, uh, in the midst of uh, a technological revolution, a very progressive yet conservative notion emerges. The proletarians of the 21st century, no matter where they are in the world, will be those who have the singular and single-minded capacity to go back to the basics, work, but work for its intrinsic value, not for money. Family, responsibility, community, and democracy. It falls to this generation to, to peel back the accumulated layers of the day-to-day -day commercialized materialistic life and to find that core of idealism. Only then will the working family of today have access to the good life. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Karl Marx. I had heard that he ran on and on and on, and I was afraid I was going to have to tell him to stop, but congratulations, you're right on time. Donna Rungi is our next presenter, and Donna is going to be presenting in the voice of Florence Scoville Shin. Um, she is a renowned artist and illustrator, a metaphysician who died in 1940. She's well known for a, a number of books that she wrote, five in fact, but two in particular, one called The Game of Life and How to Play It, and the other is The Power of the Spoken Word. I'd like to introduce Florence Shin. without their purses or their baskets? No. I had to bring mine today because I have some things in my basket that I want to share with you. And I think we can learn by example. Um, as Mr. Rarick said, I am a, an illustrator, an artist, but the thing that I love that's the dearest to me is to be able to go out and speak to you, speak to people. How many of you had to take the trolley here today to come? How many of you? Okay, it was a long ways, wasn't it? Well, I live in New York now. Um, I was raised in Philadelphia, and I've had a long, long life. And one of the most important things in my life is writing a book. And this is my book. As you can see, it's not a very big book, but it has a lot of insights in this book, some insights that I would like to share with you. One of the main books that can run our life is this one, does anybody recognize what this one is? Inside this book are a lot of stories um, that we can use and incorporate into our life. One reason that we remember a lot of the stories in this book is because there's a lot of signs, there's a lot of symbols, there's a lot of examples and stories. And that's what I would like to do today, is to give you some examples and use some of my little things in my basket to illustrate some of the stories. Uh, what, where I feel that I fit in as the role to the family is that I think it all starts with us. If we're happy, our family's going to be happy. If we have negative attitudes, negative thoughts, negative words, then nobody around us is going to be happy or want to be around us. So I think it all begins with us, but it doesn't have to be with just me alone or you alone. We have a superpower that can help us. And I want to tell you what incredible, incredible invention God gave us, and that's inside this skull. It's a little piece of mass and it's the brain. And it has three parts to the brain. One is the subconscious, one is the conscious, and one is the superconscious. The subconscious is like steam, like electricity. It does what it's directed to do. But what we do with the subconscious is we take every image, every feeling, and we record it. Do any of you have a Victrola at home that you play these on? 
Well, I do, and I'll tell you, I use my Victrola a lot, but I choose the right records that I like, that are soothing for me, that make a lot of sense to me and help me out. Now, what we do in the subconscious part of our brain is we record things in the subconscious. And um, sometimes we don't record very good things, and we hear this message. Does anybody have an Aunt Lucy that's always criticizing you? Well, I do. My Aunt Lucy said, Florence, why are you going out speaking to people? Your place is in the home. After all, this is only the early 1920s, Florence. Well, Aunt Lucy's on here, but I kind of skip by her sometimes, you know, and don't really listen when she's on my Victrola. But my brother Clarence, he took Aunt Lucy's Victrola record, and he plays it a lot, because she's always saying, Clarence, you just ain't going to amount to anything. You're so lazy, Clarence. So guess what? Clarence, he is lazy, and he doesn't have any motivation at all. So he took Aunt Lucy's record, and he plays it a lot, and he has incorporated that into his life. The second part of our brain is the conscious. It's the here, it's the now, it's that you, you are looking at me, you're hearing me, you're seeing me. The superconscious is a wonderful part that God gave us, and it's the God mind. It's we're connected to him. Perfect ideas, and he gave us the infinite intelligence within ourselves to do whatever we wanted to do. So, remember, every thought, every word records on our phonographic plate, which is our subconscious. Every, um, and if we don't run our own subconscious, then somebody else is going to run it for us. Do you ever feel like somebody else is running it for you? Well, get rid of it. <laughs> and incorporate the good one that you can keep that means a lot to you. Another thing that I would like to use is the boomerang. Have any of you ever seen this? If you, I see somebody ducking over there. <laughs> if you use this boomerang, what happens if I throw this in this big space? What happens? What'll, come, what'll it do? I almost gave it away, didn't I? It'll come back, won't it? That's what happens sometimes with our words, our thoughts, our deeds. If I say, you're such a jerk, then one of these days he might come back to me and do something bad to me, or he might have bad vibes that'll come back to me. Or with our children, if we say bad things to them or, or we do bad things to them or our spouses, then that'll come back to us. And where do we want this boomerang to end, to end up? Do we want it to end up here? If it ends up here, that's because we have probably had some bad things that have traveled along on this boomerang. If we want it to land in our hands, then that would depict some love, some trust, some connection with other people, some belief in ourselves, and belief in others also. Another thing I would like to use, and oh, I wanted to show you too, I'm so proud. This is my first book, and I, they say that it's in all corners of the world and a lot of people use it, so I don't know. I traveled a little, but not that much. Look at this great invention. The rest of my books have all ended up bound in one book and I think it's just wonderful what they can do nowadays because this is what it looked like when I wrote it you know things have changed a lot another example I wanted to use was um, have you ever heard of the word kingpin kingpin well I wanted to use that example because when the loggers in the spring are out logging they um, they take the trees and they will cut them down and drag them over to the river. And so the logs go merrily down the river, rushing as fast as they can into a holding pond. Now, we all have lots of wonderful ideas which would, we could depict in each log. This is faith. This is, I want to be a metaphysician like me. Um, this could be, I want to be a mother and I want to give love to everyone. And we all have different things in our life that um, we believe in that can be represented by all these logs. Well, sometimes as the logs go down the river, they get held up. And this, this one particular stick that's holding them up, the loggers call the kingpin. The kingpin 
won't let them go. They can't move down that river at all. And so what the loggers need to do is get in and identify which is the kingpin. We all have kingpins in our lives. Remember Aunt Lucy's kind of a kingpin in my life. I don't want to get rid of Aunt Lucy, so sometimes I have to straighten the thoughts that Aunt Lucy puts in my head so that the logs can rush down the river and I can do what I want to. Um, maybe your kingpin is, is um, resistance and maybe anger or hate or something, and it's holding you back from being who you really are. So you need to remove that kingpin so your logs can go merrily down the river too. We need a great support system with one another. And um, one of the things that I wanted to say to you, it, for children especially, is in the Bible, the arm of God always symbolizes protection. Uh, it brings a picture which impresses the subconscious. Remember, the subconscious records all these things on our Victrola record. Um, the writers of the Bible you may, use many symbols and stories like I am doing today. And um, the arm is one thing that symbolizes both protection and strength. And we need to do a lot of hugging. Give your kids a lot of hug. Give your spouse a lot of hug and so forth. Um, because that is comforting. It will give us strength and give us protection. And we will no longer resent, resist, and so forth people. Uh, one thought I want to leave you with today is I have perfect confidence myself in God and I know that God has perfect confidence in me. And if you have perfect confidence in God, I know that God has perfect confidence in you. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Our third presenter uh, this afternoon is Dr. Victor Duarte, uh, Social Sciences here at North Idaho College, who is going to provide the Latin perspective on the issue of family. For some reason, I thought I had to do a dance, a Latin dance. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> thank you, Tim. Uh, as you can see, I'm not playing a particular character this afternoon, although looking around at uh, some of the costumes that I see, I'm a little envious of my colleagues and the way they're dressed. Uh, but I did want to remember a uh, figure that was very important in the civil rights movement of this country, and especially, I think, for Hispanics, and uh, that was uh, Cesar Chavez, or perhaps uh, you may know him better as Cesar Chavez, uh, because I think that... Um, in the course of trying to improve the working conditions and the living conditions of the migrants, many of the migrants being Hispanic, um, he also indirectly helped to uh, improve the quality of family life for the migrants. And uh, if you know much about migrant work, you know there's a lot of seasonal work, there's a lot of uh, moving around. Uh, the children sometimes have to work. There are harsh working conditions and so on. And this seems to work against the integrity of the family. Uh, and I think uh, Cesar Chavez understood that. He understood the focus that Hispanics have on the family. And um, by helping to improve the conditions of the migrants, uh, he also, I think, uh, helped to keep the family intact. So. Uh, from my perspective, uh, Hispanics uh, do focus on the family, and it's very central to their day-to-day -day experiences. Uh, but I also ask myself the question, is this also not true of other groups? And in preparing for this presentation, I wonder whether, in fact, there was a specific Latin perspective of the family that differed from the perspective of the members of the dominant culture in this country. And um, I came to the conclusion that there is. Uh, a difference or a specific Latin perspective. Um, and to some extent, it uh, mirrors what uh, we heard this morning in Dr. Meza's speech. And she made a distinction between familialism and individualism. And definitely, I think, in the Latin culture, they're heavily in the direction of the familialism end of that spectrum. Uh, whereas what I've noticed in uh, this country, since I've come to this country, I was not born here, I was born in El Salvador, 
is that uh, children are encouraged, they are conditioned to leave the family, you know, as soon as they can. And once they leave the family, they're encouraged to move away from the family as far away as they can. And um, to also, when they leave, to keep minimal contact with the family. Whereas the Latin perspective is very much different. Uh, Latin children are encouraged to stay longer in the family, uh, sometimes uh, perhaps into their 20s even. And uh, also their, their mindset is not one where individualism is more important, but rather uh, working within the context of the family. I think that in the Latin uh, family, there's more of a family mindset as opposed to an individual mindset. And I think to some extent, this explains one of the reasons why Hispanics have such a high dropout rate uh, from high school. Because when they can, they go to work, but they don't go to work to try to buy a car and so on. Rather, they go to work to provide and to bring money back into the family. So I think there's a difference there. Also, I think that they are encouraged to stay as close as they can uh, to the family physically and to maintain uh, very close contact ties with uh, their family of origin. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned by Karl Marx was this downsizing trend that we see uh, in business today to make businesses more profitable, more competitive. Well, it also seems to me that in America, especially in the last 25 to 30 years, there's been a downsizing of the American family. It seems to me that the goal of, of many families today is to have the least number of children. In fact, the fewer the better, it seems like. Uh, you know, it's, it's almost as if children are seen as hindrances, obstacles to a certain kind of lifestyle. Whereas in the Latin tradition, I think that, that children are seen as very important parts of the family and also for the future of the family. Uh, so there's a difference there in terms of, of, of the perspective uh, that uh, families have about children. And um, I think this also may partly explain the reason why uh, Latins as, as a group have larger families than other groups in, in this society. And then there's yet another way, I think, in which the Latin perspective differs from the dominant perspective uh, in this country. Uh, it seems to me that uh, what I notice in this society is, is what I call an inward focus of the family, uh, meaning that there is a tendency to uh, focus on the nuclear family over and above, not only the extended family, but other segments of the society. Uh, the intent is to differentiate as much as possible the nuclear family from uh, any other elements of the society. Uh, whereas in the Latin tradition, uh, not only do I think we have an inward focus, we do believe that the nuclear family is the base, but I also think that we have an outward focus. Uh, that is to say that the extended family becomes very important to us. Uh, not only blood relationships, but also even non-blood relationships. Um, the Latin family tries to incorporate as many individuals as it can into the family circle. The more the better from the Latin perspective, I think. Uh, one of the uh, customs that we have in the um, Latin countries, which is not unknown in this country, <coughs> is something called the compadrasco system. And uh, what that is, is basically godparenting. But uh, in the Latin countries, godparenting is more than symbolic. There are practical responsibilities that godparents have to have, uh, whereas they may have to uh, ultimately take care of the children uh, who they sponsor and so on. And in many instances, it is not unknown in our country for uh, godsons and goddaughters to actually live with uh, their godparents for a prolonged period of time. Um, in fact, I myself, when I was about seven years old, had to live with uh, my mother's comadre. That's a, it's a very special word that's used amongst the adults in these relationships. And in fact, I don't think there's a direct translation for the word comadre. Uh, in English, I think Joyce being up front can probably tell me whether in fact there is, but uh, <laughs> when the adults in this uh, relationship of godparenting uh, become involved because of the sacraments of the church, primarily the Catholic Church, baptism and confirmation, there is a lifelong strong bond that develops amongst the adults in these relationships. And what it turns out is that the, each other becomes a comadre or a compadre. And so to be called a comadre or a compadre is, is a sign of honor. 
and, and so it is a very important relationship that develops. And oftentimes, uh, the individuals that become uh, godparents aren't even necessarily uh, blood relatives. Uh, in many instances, they are, in fact, uh, extended family members. But many, many times, uh, you eventually end up choosing people outside uh, of the family circle, that is, blood circle. And so you can see here where there's this outward focus, as I call it, where the Latin family tries to incorporate as many individuals as, as it can uh, into the family circle. Uh, not only that, but uh, as it turns out, I don't know what the practice is here, but it's my impression that uh, when you uh, sponsor a child that you normally have a set of godparents, right? Uh, two at most. But in the Latin custom, you can try to have as many as you want. I mean, the church formally recognizes only two, but you can have as many as you want. And, and uh, when my daughter was born, I have a one and two month year old daughter. And last year we had to baptize her. And so we were wondering about who was gonna be the godparents of, 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 um, of, of the little girl, my little girl. And you know, we eventually ended up with six godparents. So uh, it turns out that what that does, though, is that it does incorporate all these other individuals uh, into this sphere, if you will, or family. And uh, it's kind of interesting that from a psychological perspective, we are finding out that uh, one of the uh, things that one can do to reduce stress is to uh, have access to an extensive uh, social support system. Uh, and uh, you know for that support system, of course, being there to help you and to uh, support you and so on. But uh, in the land culture, that's already a built-in uh, mechanism. That's already in place and, and working quite well. Um, so there, I think, quite a, quite a few differences uh, between a Latin perspective and a perspective that is perhaps more common to the dominant culture here. And in uh, my presentation today, I've, I've tried to identify the differences, but of course, I understand that there are quite a lot of similarities as well. But to conclude, I would like to say that uh, if you look at what's happening in the society today in the context of this uh, continuum of a familialism versus an individualism perspective, I think that we are heading too much in the direction of the individualism perspective, and I think that takes away a great deal from the stability of the society and so, in a way, I'm comforted by the fact that coming from that Latin background, I do have access to that extended support system. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Victor. Uh, perhaps a lesser known figure than, than some that we've uh, heard from today is the um, uh, character that is going to be impersonated uh, by Carol Lindsay. Carol Lindsay, um, an NIC instructor here at in Social Sciences, Child Development, is the, going to be the voice of Marion Wright Edelman. Um, Marion Edelman was the founder and president of the Children's Defense Fund since its inception in 1973. This African-American woman received a MacArthur Foundation Prize in 1985, a Schweitzer Humanitarian Award in 1987, the Hubert Humphrey Civil Rights Award in, in 1989, and the Gandhi Peace Award in 1990. She is alive and well and continues to serve as the foremost advocate for children and families, and she's here today. Uh, I'd like to wear, uh, welcome Marion Wright Edelman. Apparently something happened on the plane right over here. I became terribly pale. Um, anyways, good afternoon. My name is Marion Wright Edelman, and I really am pleased to be part of this panel. I find it interesting and uh, timely that it is entitled The Historical Human Quest for the Development of the Survival of the Family. We are at a very curious time right now, historically. We are at the edge, um, verge of passing into a new century but also into a new millennium. And I think any time that happens, we often take a step back and we say, where have we been for the last 100 years? What have we, have we accomplished? What obstacles have we faced? And we do that at the end of a century, at, at, at the end of a thousand, every thousand years. So I think it's interesting that we are here at this time and we'll be looking at where have we been, where are we going, and where are we right now? And I have to say, the title of this uh, panel is so timely because our families indeed are in a struggle for survival. 
just today in the United States, as there is every day in the United States, 365 days a year, 16 children died of uh, gun-inflicted wounds. Every two days, an entire classroom perishes of young children due to uh, death by gunshot. If you were to take the combined figures of children who die by gunshot wounds for the entire 26 top industrial nations in the world, three out of four of those children would be American children. Today in America, 466 babies are born to mothers who had no prenatal care. 2,556 babies today and every day for this next year are born into poverty. Every day, including today, 3,000, think of this, just today, 3,356 high school students dropped out. Today, 6,042 children under the age of 15 are arrested. In this country today, 13,076 public school students are suspended. Um, also today, as of today, uh, 10 million children have no health care. Nine million, nine-tenths of those children are children of working parents. Perhaps the saddest statistic of all is that 95% of Americans, that's almost all of you in this room, believe that those statistics have nothing to do with you. Uh, President Clinton in the State of the Union address this year reassured all of us that our, that our union is strong. But I ask, how strong is the union between blacks and whites, men and women, when affirmative action backlash stalls the progress of the last 30 years in breaking the stronghold of the white male? Blacks and women make up only a small minority in corporate and legal corridors of power. Women make up 11% of congressional power, and blacks only 7% of congressional power. And after the last election, it went down. Um, although they represent 51% and 31% of the population, respectively. How strong is our economic union when the gap between the rich, the middle class, and the poor is, is at its widest as it's been in decades? Um, and I enjoyed Karl Marx's uh, remarks earlier, and I have one that's similar to that, that um, last year, the top 35 CEOs in this country received bonuses, not salaries, bonuses that would have lifted 171,000 children out of poverty in this country. How strong is our sense of fairness and our sense of commitment to families and children and our union when in the 1996 election year, our leaders voted to end, quote, welfare as we know it by dismantling a 60-year-old safety net to children and families without asking one red cent from the Pentagon. In fact, $54 billion of health and nutrition assistance to children, $54 billion, will be dismantled and removed over the next five years. And the Pentagon last year received $11.5 billion it didn't even ask for. Their actions, the legislative actions, will push another one million children into poverty by the end of 1998. It will push those millions of children already into poverty deeper and deeper. It's estimated in the next two years, another two and a half million children will join the ranks of the 10 million who have no health insurance in this country. Let's not fool ourselves about this Welfare Reform Act. This is not welfare reform, it is welfare repeal. What we ought to be looking for and concentrating on is welfare prevention. In order for true reform to happen, here's what we need. We need assurance of basic health care and nutrition to children in poverty while their parents are receiving job training and they're looking for work. We must create job opportunities and we must create job training. The number of entry-level jobs that are going to have to be created for all the people coming off of welfare is staggering. Don't fool yourselves. The unemployment rate is only going to rise. We must provide quality child care for parents during job training, and we must subsidize parents who need it. It's estimated that the majority of parents who are coming off of welfare, uh, who have two years to get the training and to be there, 
will um, end up in minimum wage jobs where the cost of child care for one child will cost 40 to 65 percent of their monthly wages. It's easy with, when overwhelmed with the largeness um, and the complexity of these problems to feel you can't contribute as a single citizen, but you can. First, you can become an informed advocate. There's a lot of political rhetoric out there right now about the value of the family and how we need to get people back to work and we have to make people self-sustaining and responsible. And frankly, it's a lot of crap. We have people out here who must take responsibility for creating responsible families who have the options and the opportunities to do so. Seek out information. There are a number of community groups in every community across the country that can provide you with this information. Read the newspaper and vote. Get out and vote. Second, join me in contacting your congressman about a very interesting bill that's come up. You'll love this name. It's called the Child Health and Budget Deficit Bill. And it is being sponsored, even more unbelievable, by Senator Orrin Hatch and Senator Edward Kennedy. Now there's a duo that doesn't usually come together. What this will do is it will allocate $20 million in health assurance for children in poverty. And it will use the existing system. It is not creating a new medical system. It will create a system of vouchers for families and children who need them. $20 billion. It will also create or reduce uh, our deficit by $10 billion by a $0.47 cent a pack tax on cigarettes. And by the way, research has shown that for every 10 cents uh, you increase the pack of cigarettes, there is a resulting 8 to 10 percent decrease in teen, teen smoking. Not a bad bet. Uh, finally, I invite you to stand for the children this June 1st. In all 50 states, tens and hundreds and thousands and perhaps millions of people are coming together in every state, in most communities, in a Stand for the Children um, Act. And last year we had our first one. It was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. 250,000 people spontaneously arrived at the Lincoln Memorial. Not a single celebrity was there, and we all stood for children. One of the people who was there was Rosa Parks. And Rosa Parks said, if I can sit down for justice, you can damn well stand for children. I'd like to close with a fitting story about Sojourner Truth the black slave woman who fought long and hard for slavery and for women's rights. One day, Sojourner was up on her soap, soapbox preaching about the importance of uh, anti-slavery movement, and a male, white male came up to her and said, Sojourner, I don't give a flea's bite for your talk. And she said, well, ain't that a shame? I'm going to keep you scratching. So join me. Stand for America's children and families. Become part of the solution. Don't turn a blind eye. And let's keep them big dogs scratching. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Edelman. The final presentation in our panel this afternoon um, is from Dorinda Moore. At the outbreak of World War II, when thousands of men marched off to war, they marched out of thousands of jobs. And that meant that thousands of women marched into those jobs. And the symbolic woman who marched into that job was called Rosie the Riveter. And Rosie has taken time off from work to join us today. Uh, I'd like to present to you Rosie the Riveter. Johnny, he left for the war right after Pearl Harbor. Our two boys, JJ, which was John Jr., and Mike, they were 10 and 7 when he left. That was three years ago. Well, first year we picked up, moved from our hometown in Plainview, Texas. We moved way out to Seattle. Well, we wanted to be closer to Johnny. When he, when he left, we didn't know the war was going to last, last as long as it did. But when he left, our family was in balance. It's like this mobile here. 
Everybody had their own job, knew what was expected of them. Then, when Johnny left, well, you can see what happened. Everything went out of kilter. Took the boys and me almost a year to figure out exactly how to find a new balance. But we've adjusted. My boys are good boys. They've changed. I've changed. Gee, we've all changed, though. It was really tough on us the first year. We'd always lived near our families before. Well, at Johnny's folks, they lived over in Lubbock, and my folks, they just lived three blocks from us. And my sister and Johnny's brothers and their families, they all went to the same church we did. So even if we didn't see them through the week, which was real rare, we'd always get to see them on Sunday. Fact is, they'd just come over to our house, usually after church on Sunday, have dinner, mainly because I had the piano. Well, we'd barely get the dishes done. Mama and Papa would start right in. Come on, everybody, let's do some singing. Johnny, go get the boys, bring them in now. Come on now, come on. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling Clementine, you will all stand gone forever, dreadful sorry, Clementine. They love that song. Mama, it's too hot to come in and sing. Nobody likes those old songs anyway. But, well, wasn't long. Pretty soon we'd all join in. Before you know it, you could hear all four parts of harmony drifting out through the open windows and onto the porch, out into the yard. Oh, my darling, oh, my darling, oh, my darling Clementine. Oh, well, pretty soon the cousins, they had quit their fussing. They had come in and join us to be nightfall before we knew it. Then we'd just kind of, I don't know, grab our, fix us a sandwich and grab our lemonade. We'd go sit out on the front porch and just watch the kids play hide and seek. I thought my life would always be like that. Why, if anyone would have told me on one of those Sunday afternoons that I'd be raising my boys by myself and living on the Pacific Ocean, I would have laughed right in their face. But move to the Pacific Ocean, we did. Well, the first year, Johnny got stationed over in Huntsville, Alabama, temporarily. Then, boys and I, we decided that we better stay there in Texas, near the folks, until we knew exactly where he was going to be permanently. After six months, they sent him to Seattle. Well, that was just swell. I'd never heard of Seattle before. Didn't even know if it was in America or not. Well, we got out our map. Sure enough, there it was, right next to the Pacific Ocean. Well, there was no way I was going to let Johnny go that far away from me, not be able to see him at least on the weekends. Johnny almost raised his voice to me. Rosalie, that's what he called me, I want you and the boys to stay here in Texas near the folks. This is where you belong. I looked him square in the eye. Johnny, I don't argue with you very much, but I'm putting my foot down this time. I'm going to Seattle. Wow, when we got here, there were so many new things to see, and we met so many nice people on the base. But then, Johnny got sent to the South Pacific, and I began to feel the imbalance. Things weren't the same as they had been before. Boys and I, we didn't have much money, so we moved in with another lady and her kids. It was real tough at first. I didn't know exactly what we were going to do. 
I miss Johnny something terrible. I wrote to him, though. Dear Johnny, don't worry about us, darling. We're doing fine. Sometimes I do think about moving back home with Mom and Papa, but then I just can't bear the thought of not being there on the shore when you come home. Hurry home, darling. Well, I thought about getting a job right away, but President Roosevelt had come on the radio. Our boys are fighting for home sweet home. It's your job, women of America, to keep the home fires burning. Keep the family together. Well, what could I do? I thought about it a lot. Didn't know exactly where to go from here. Then all of a sudden I thought, that idea is not going to last very long. And it didn't last very long either. Why, we'd only been in the war about a year or so, I guess. And Secretary of War Stimson, he came on one of the newsreels. He said we had to double the number of women hired for wartime jobs. Well, after that, we were encouraged to take a job. Why, you'd see it <clears throat> in the newsreels, at the movies when you'd go. You'd see it in posters on the storefronts. Why, even Mrs. Roosevelt was encouraging us to take a job then. Well, I brought along some of the posters. Thought you might like to look at them. They were mighty, mighty strong propaganda. There was all sorts of them just encouraging us women to work. My personal favorite. But you know the one that really got to me was the one that says the fortresses and the men that are flying them are fighting for you, your homeland, everything that you hold dear. Are you doing your part? Whew. Well, then in my McCall magazine, just happened to have it here, it says that the American housewife must learn to keep her head, her temper, mm -hmm. and her he, uh, roll up her sleeves all at the same time. And if she can't, the men fighting on the foreign hills may be slaughtered in the hot sun for lack of ammunition. Well, once I started working at the Boeing airplane plant in Seattle, I felt like I was really contributing something to the job. Johnny had been gone for almost a year now, but at my workbench every day, every rivet that I would hammer in home, I'd tell myself that it was another nail in Hitler's coffin. I wrote Johnny about my job. You better watch out how you talk to me when you come home, because I've developed a big right muscle in my arm. Fact is, I've got more than just a muscle, though, to show for my hard work. While I'm sporting this pretty little pin here, I didn't think I'd ever get it in a thousand years, but we got it for winning the E Award for efficiency. We worked hard. Those men who didn't want to hire us last year because we were women, well, they're always yelling, Rosie, that's what they call me now at the plant, Rosie do this, Rosie do that. They're mighty proud of us though. Things have changed. Boys and I, we've had to find a new balance in life. I've been mighty proud to get my hands dirty during the war. And I don't plan on cleaning them up in dishwater after the war. It may be tough when Johnny comes marching home. 
may be hard for him to accept that the things on the home front are not the same as they were when Johnny left. I'm mighty proud. Now that I've gained some independence, I plan on keeping it. I can't go back to the way I was before. I've changed. Rosalie's not here anymore. But Johnny's changed too. And we'll find a new balance. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling. Oh, my darling Clementine. You were lost and gone forever. Dreadful sorry. Rosalie. Thank you to Carl Marx. Thank you to Florence Shin. Thank you to Victor Duarte. Thank you to Marion Wright Edelman. And thank you, Rosie. Many of you attended the presentation this morning. Um, but it is my pleasure to reintroduce to some of you uh, Dr. Diane Medved. To save us a little bit of time, I would like to just simply acknowledge that uh, uh, Dr. Medved is a well-known lecturer, writer, a clinical psychologist in private practice, and it is our honor to have her here to respond to what has happened in the last hour. And I'd like to present to you Dr. Diane Medved, please. Thank you, and thank you to our esteemed colleagues and historical dead people. <laughs> um, I just had a few thoughts that I wanted to share with each of our um, personae who are here. I hate to give you my back, but um, first of all, I want to start with uh, Mr. Marx. Mr. Marx, they noticed um, beyond that newspaper that those who have tried experiments have found that they failed that people are not necessarily alienated from their work and that families are not necessarily torn apart by people's jobs. We found in the intervening years since your proposal that trying some of your ideas, while very neat and on paper and in theory, has brought destruction and bloodshed, repression, killing of the human spirit, lack of desire to achieve or to be motivated. Right now, in the former Soviet Union, there is zero compliance with tax law. And that's after they've abandoned the system that you propose. Now, maybe the system you propose never happened. Maybe it wasn't allowed to happen. But those people who claimed to be implementing it weren't able to do so. So perhaps there were some flaws in it. The idea of no wages. The idea that people should be able to work or that they should work and work very hard and earn nothing and get everything, all the decisions made for them. Maybe they get a house, but what a house. Maybe they get food, but they get to stand in line for it for hours and hours and only really get the food after they pay somebody off or after they tap somebody that they know on the shoulder to repay a favor. And also, you negated the idea that people could ever, ever enjoy work. You negated the idea that work could be for anything other than to enrich an employer. Well, it could be that people could aspire to be employers themselves, and that they could even have a good time working their way up to the top getting there. <coughs> also, you negated some of the consequences, the psychological consequences on the family of the imposition of your system. People who go to work every day and who don't get paid end up coming home and feeling no reason to go back to work. In fact, they'll work less hard the next day because they're not going to get any less for working less hard. They're going to get the same amount. So it, it's, you may say from each according to his ability to each according to his need, but the truth is that once you take from each according to his ability, that ability shrinks and shrinks and shrinks. 
because you don't have to work for it and there's no payoff. So I'm sorry, Mr. Marx. Well, it looked good on paper, and while students nowadays in colleges across the country still study it, and while your devoted followers still inhabit maybe many professorial positions in those golden towers of baby boom ageism, um, I'm afraid that time has told the tale and that your system is a flop. So, just, just a few. Sorry, couldn't help it. Okay, moving on to Florence Scoville Shin, who is somebody um, I was not familiar with, but who, from what you're saying, seems to be a forerunner of much of New Age psychology, and also seems to be a forerunner of some of the religions that were in the early part of the 20th century, Mary Baker Eddy, some of the other, oh, that's Christian science, in case you're unfamiliar with that, some of the other flamboyant approaches to life that she seems to be in concert with. There, it was a time of um, new ex exploration. You said you're in the 20s, although it's not a flapper's outfit. <laughs> But still, there's a spirit of exploration. There's a spirit that you can take objects and let them symbolize things that are invisible. Things that are not tangible can be grasped by the use of tangible items, of illustration, of concretizing ideas that people typically at that time didn't have much time to think about. Most people in the 20s were struggling to make a living. And while there was flamboyant music, that was largely a distraction so that people could have some fun and pleasure. And I don't think that really that many people were focused on some of these internal psychological dramas that were going on and unfolding and that were illustrated by Mrs. Shin. Is it Mrs. Shin? Yes? I don't know if it's Mrs. or Miss. But I found it very interesting that she held up the Bible and that she found that one of the oldest sources of wisdom could be then transformed into imagery that was very modern at the time and still seems to hold. When you see her come up here with her basket of goodies and talk as she does about kingpins that let forth, those are blockages, the things that you do to inhibit yourself from succeeding or fulfilling yourself, that becomes very concrete and it is definitely some of the ideas that psychologists use. In fact, I dare say that were she to be promulgating her ideas nowadays in the state of Idaho or Washington or California, she'd be required to get a license. <laughs> the idea of lots of hugging, by the way, I think um, was ahead of her time because in those days there were many people who thought that schooling for children should be very strict and that parents' uh, job was basically to inculcate children, not necessarily with a lot of warmth. So the idea of the free spirit and the love and the hugging and having perfect confidence in yourself, this idea of self-esteem, my gosh, it became so popular in the 60s and they didn't even realize they got it from her. So I think these, these ideas were ahead of their time and if people would listen to them, they were probably eternally useful and helpful to anyone of any time period. So I was very impressed to meet you. Um, Dr. Warte talked about the Latin perspective, which I enjoyed very much. He was talking about Cesar Chavez, who from my uh, days in college I remember quite well, and his notion that one would improve the integrity of the family by improving the working conditions of those people who were basically working for very poor wages under very bad conditions and forced into those, to those situations because of poverty. Well, what I've seen from my contact with uh, the Latin perspective and having been born and raised in Los Angeles and always been around quite a few Latin people, mi espanol es muy malo, lo siento. Um, <laughs> hablo como una gringa. <laughs> But in any case, um, it reminded me of a family that I interviewed in my book with Dan Quill, The American Family, the De La Rosa family, who live in East LA. And getting to know them, I did see this very um, great importance placed on children and extended family. Those were two of the items that I came forth. And really what I heard Dr. Huarte elaborating on was the idea of extended family in three different ways. One, that children are encouraged to stay, that they're not encouraged to leave. They're supposed to stay around home. 
too, that you want to have as many of them as you can because you want to extend the family. This is extended family by keeping them here, not letting go of them, by having as many as you can, and thirdly, by bringing in anyone who you can possibly find as either a comadre or a compadre or as just someone in the neighborhood. When I talk to these people in East LA, they brought in the man who owns the market at the end of the block. And they brought in the neighbor who lived down the street. Now these were people who were related it by any means, but they were part of life because there was a sense of stability, not a sense of movement, of change. It was a matter of you make your home, you make your place, you make your religion, you make your family, and these things are permanent. They don't change. And uh, I appreciate it very much, Dr. Warte's explanation of that. Thank you. And I'm glad that you in Idaho get to hear that. You know, I think um, you may not have as much contact with the Spanish perspective and the Hispanic perspective, and I find that a wonderful, enriching balance to add to all the information you're getting. Marion Wright Edelman, I found a little bit infuriating. <laughs> because there's always two sides to every coin. And while everyone can agree that there are certain problems for children in our country, and that we're very, very far from finding the perfect solutions to everything, who's to say that her solutions are the only ones available to tackle these problems? She talked about uh, 16 children die every day of gunshot wounds. That's horrible. That's awful. But what do we do? Do we make sure that people can't have guns, which is something that she was seeming to imply? Or do we make sure that people who have guns are trained and that people who, I mean, if you're going to bring a gun to school, then you're breaking the law. If you're going to be shooting a child, then you're definitely breaking the law. These are criminals. We have to make sure that the criminals are punished as criminals and not lament just the fact that these victims, these poor, innocent victims, have been shot. It's a terrible thing, but what do you do about it? Well, there may be more than one way to tackle that. She mentioned 3,000 high school students drop out in a day. Well, that is a horrible thing. What do we do about it? Do we make more programs? Does the government step in? Well, it could be that we have to teach more people about the value of education and that through their own initiative, by completing their educations, then they have a chance that they don't need to depend on somebody else, they don't need to depend on the government, that they have it within themselves, they have the power, they have the strength, they have the brains and the capability. And inculcating those virtues, those values, why do you think Bill Bennett's book sold millions and millions of copies? because we believe we can do it. We don't need the government to do it. We don't need to have more taxes and more programs. We need to believe in ourselves, and we need to encourage everyone around us to believe in themselves too. So I was a little infuriated because while the statistics that she presented to us and the facts that she presented to us certainly engage our sympathy and cause us to want to do something, there's still questions about what is the right thing to do. It doesn't mean that you sit back and you just let it happen. It means that you have to find the least intrusive way to accomplish what you want. And think about that very carefully. Don't just assume that there's only one way to go. The affirmative action backlash was one of the favorites for me. Because women typically have these doors open to them. For, you know, affirmative action is not a new thing. Affirmative action has been around for 20 years. When I was in graduate school, there was affirmative action. And I'm a baby boomer, so it's been a while. It isn't like women have been shut out. It's that women have found themselves. And what they found is that being a mother, being a parent, is important to them. So what do they do? They want to combine using their strengths in the workplace with being a mother, which means typically they'll take time off from a career. Now, when you take time off from a career or you practice your career in intervals, then you're not going to get up to the CEO. But you ask any mother of a six-year-old, is your goal to be a CEO right now? She's not going to say that. She's going to say, wait a minute, my goal is to do carpool today. My goal is to make sure that everything runs smoothly in the lives of the people I care about. Now, that doesn't mean she's incapable. That doesn't mean that she's not going to go back to work. But what that means is that she often, most women, now these are confirmed by poll after poll after poll, 65% of women wish that they didn't have to work. This is women who work. And most women who do work only work part-time. 
Women with children in childbearing age, they choose to work part-time. Does that mean that they've been oppressed and that affirmative action hasn't worked? No, it means that they have managed their lives to do it all. And when you try and do it all, you find there's something that's got to go a little bit. So I don't think that rage about the lack of affirmative action is appropriate. I think we should be proud and pleased that women and men now have opportunities to do what they want and that it's okay to be a homemaker again and that it's okay to take time off of work. There was a time when it was embarrassing for a woman to say, I'm a homemaker, I'm a mother, I'm a mom. Thank God now we have the choice to say, yes, I'm a mom and be as proud of that as a woman who says, yes, I'm running a Fortune 500 company. I could go on and on on this one. Um, but I do want to conclude with Rosie the Riveter. I th thought that was an engrossing performance, a wonderful performance, a really just a tearjerker, partially because I know women who were Rosie the Riveters during World War II. My mother actually went back to, my mother was born in 1915. She actually did go to work during World War II. She worked at McDonnell Douglas. She was not a riveter, though. She worked in the office there. But she had friends who were riveters at McDonnell Douglas. It was on Ocean Park Boulevard in Santa Monica if any of you remember that. And it was an interesting time because everybody pitched in with the war. But the one thing I would disagree with Rosie on was that after the war, while everyone had changed, men and women, how can war not change you? How can that experience not change you? But still, the thing I found quite fascinating for the Rosie the Riveters that I knew about were that they came home, and in, when the men came home in 1946, there was an as astounding leap in the marriage rate. And in 1947, 1948, 1949, on through the mid-1950s, up to 60, there was the baby boom. So what did these women want to do? Do they want to keep working? No. They were holding down the fort. They were keeping the home fires burning for their guys to come home. And then when they came home, they went back to the home and they showed the men that their skills had not deteriorated. That while they were stronger, Emotionally, financially, they, were, they knew they could take care of themselves. They still found that the love of their husband and the love of their children was how they wanted to spend their time. And frankly, the 1950s, by most sociologists' accounts, is one of the most idyllic times in our history. One of the times when people report the most happiness. That show Happy Days wasn't called that because it was sad days. It was because we looked nostalgically on the time that Ro Rosie the Riveter came home, had her kids, and provided us with the warm fuzzies that we all now enjoy. So those are a few of my impressions. I'll be eager to hear yours. Thank you. We do have a short period of time where the panel is willing, able, ready to take some questions from the audience. So please feel free to do that. Right up front here, please. Well, I don't think that it's very easy, even in telecommunications, to be a CEO at home. And I think women are now feeling, I mean, this is obviously generalization, and there will be exceptions. But I think women are now feeling that raising kids is okay again. I mean, notice the rebirth of the homeschooling movement. Women want to raise their own kids. They're realizing how precious that time is and how fleeting it is. And so I think while there will be a lot more home-based businesses, and there will be a lot of communications industries where people work part-time, I still think that they'll want to take some time off, particularly when their babies are little and when they're most physically demanding. And more women are nursing, for example. It used to be the thing that you pump your milk and then you go off to work and you give the baby your milk in a bottle. Women don't like that too much. They'd rather have the baby in their arms and get the reward rather than pump it into a machine. And so I see that they're now able to grasp more options and use them better for their own benefit. Oh, I'm not. Second question. Yeah. Yes. Um, I'd like to comment on Dr. Marx. Um, uh, do you know who Gus Hall was? Of course, he died, he was born in, uh, and died after you. Uh, Gus Hall was the president of the, of the American Communist Party. And someone had once asked him, um, uh, what's the future of communism in America? And he said, well, in Europe, everybody wants to beat the boss. 
overthrow the boss. In America, everybody wants to be the boss. And that's a, a, a question of viewpoint. I'd like to ask you, should you find the family? Nobody's done that. That's easy. <laughs> I do this all the time. It's a uh, group of people who are related by blood, marriage, or adoption, who live together. Not, not the nuclear family um, long ago. Well, that could be an extended family, blood, marriage, or adoption. That's the family. Uh, we have a third question. Yes. Well, I just want to mention something. I haven't, that hasn't been brought up during this whole seminar, but is that with the changing role of the women working and the men working, I'm sure there's a lot of men out there that I know of that would enjoy playing the role of being a father. And so somewhere along the way, there's got to be a compromise in, in our idea. Well, we see a lot of creative situations here. And there are some fathers who, who choose to stay home while their wives work. It's very atypical. If you ask uh, men in this room, if you took a poll, OK, guys, how many of you would like to stay home and raise the kids while your wives are at work? Um, <laughs> There's some, that would be great. That would be great. There are people who are doing it. There's certainly nothing wrong with it. And I certainly think that a father's love of a child is far superior than a, a daycare worker's love of a child. And so I'm happy to see fathers staying at home. I think it's a wonderful thing. And that this new um, trend toward elevating and praising fatherhood can only bring good to the children in those families. Oh, okay. But Tony, Tony, we still have a couple minutes. Is that right? I Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I just wanted to make a comment to that, too, that um, I think fathers are playing a bigger role, as they should, and I think parental responsibility is both maternal and paternal. However, I would also like to comment that often those options are not available. And when um, Ms. Medved made the comment that these are not supports necessary for her, she's talking from a, a middle-class Caucasian perspective. She is not talking from that of a single parent um, usually mother in poverty. Um, and about 78 to 80 percent of people who are on welfare are single parent females with one to two children who do not have the options that she was talking about. And I thought it was both an insensitive remark and I also was offended by it. 